thank you for joining us for the advanced pruning presentation. If you have any questions about what we cover here today or any general urban forestry questions, please email us at ufvolunteers at portlandoregon.gov. Uh, joining us today is Dylan Slido, a tree inspector with permitting and regulation for urban forestry, designed and made in Hawaii and now available through the PN, throughout the PNW. Dylan has been a certified arborist for over 15 years and is currently an urban forestry commissioner for the city of Vancouver. We also have Claire Carney, Outreach and Stewardship Coordinator and sender of many emails. Claire is also a certified arborist and came to us from upstate New York, where she supported urban forestry programs as an extension agent with Cornell University. I will now go ahead and turn it over to Claire for today's presentation, Advanced Pruning. Awesome, thanks Maggie. Portland Parks and Recreation Urban Forestry mission is to manage and ensure Portland's urban forest infrastructure for current and future generations. Our urban forest consists of over 220,000 street trees, 1.2 million park trees, and an innumerable private property trees. Urban forestry is involved in managing or regulating all those trees to differing degrees, from fostering community tree awareness and stewardship to developing tree policies and programs, issuing permits for planting, pruning, and removal of public and private trees, as well as responding to tree emergencies. Thanks for joining us today for advanced pruning. So I hope that you guys have taken ahead of time an introduction to pruning class in some way. We had our class back on May, uh, May 2nd, I believe it was. Um, and we had a great audience there, many of you which returned, um, but just so uh, if any of you have not attended any kind of introduction class, please do that first. This is advanced pruning. We will be going into some of these goals a little bit more in depth, and it is great to have a background knowledge before proceeding. Uh, so if you have not taken introduction, it is available on our webpage. Um, you can check that out online. So just to kind of go over a little bit of a review of the introduction to pruning, uh, just as a refresher for those who haven't taken pruning in a little while, uh, but have in the past, uh, just to kind of go over what we what we follow when we go about uh, approaching pruning your young tree. So know your reason for pruning, increase safety, improve structure, maintain street and sidewalk clearance. You can check online if you do think you may need a permit. Only prune trees where you can safely access the branches. So not only is it really important to wear your personal protective equipment like gloves and eyewear and safety vests, it's really important to only go to attempt to prune branches that you can safely access. You don't need to do anything really far over ahead of yourself, um, just making sure that you're making good choices and safe choices. Uh, make sure that you know what tools you're using and how to use them. So go over that back in the intro to pruning just to kind of see what different tools are appropriate for the task at hand. Make sure you feel comfortable with the tools that you have. Uh, make sure that you really know like how to grip them, how to use them, where the blade needs to be. Uh, just really practice that and feel comfortable with them. Make sure you're always making your pruning cuts just outside the branch collar. You really don't want to damage that callus tissue that's going to be in the cells surrounding that area. So as long as you don't damage the branch collar, the tree will be able to respond appropriately and seal over that wound. We'll talk about that a little bit more in depth in a few minutes, but uh, just make sure that you always follow those goals of tree pruning, but never take more than 25% of live canopy. Remember, these goals of tree pruning are not a checklist for you to complete each time in its entirety every time you prune. Although many trees, many people see tree pruning as another chore to just get through and complete each year or every few years, it's a lot more than that. You're working with a living organism and it's gonna respond and react to how you treat it and care for it. Today with advanced pruning, I would like to take the goals that we have and dive a little deeper into each one of them beyond the bark. Understanding how trees grow and function, what different tree species need, different considerations for care, and learning how to read your tree and responding will help you on your journey to mastering tree pruning. So here in this image, we have some students from Grant High School who planted trees at the Marshall campus last spring in 2019 through our Learning Landscapes program. We know that trees grow in two ways. They grow in primary growth, which is going to be your shoots and roots, so getting those new branches and leaves to produce the energy that the tree needs to get settled into its new home, while also establishing that root system. So putting out the little roots that are going to really lay the foundation for the tree to make its new home really the best it can be. 
those roots are really, really important for that tree. They provide support, they provide energy storage, so all that energy that's being produced in the leaves, if there's excess, it does get saved in the roots for use when there's not access to immediate uh, energy production. Uh, the roots also aid in absorbing water and nutrients from the soil to produce all that sugar that we get up in the leaves. So things just go up and down in that system there and uh, primary growth really focusing on survival and establishment. So really uh, what we need to survive, the tree is really focusing on those basic needs before it starts to get focused on becoming biggest and strongest tree that it can be. Although these different tree species, they take their own time getting their feet under them. A nice rule of thumb after you do plant a tree is that whatever the number of inches diameter the tree is at planting, that's about how many years your tree will take to establish. So if you planted a right-of-way tree, it will be uh, by regulation at least one and a half inches. And so that tree should take about a year and a half to start getting onto its secondary growth. That secondary growth, uh, most of you at some point, I believe, have probably tried to count the rings of a tree to see what its age is. It's something that a lot of us experienced um, as youth in different camps or schools. Uh, we've done it at lots of our outreach and tabling events. So if you've stopped by in the last year, you might have seen that. Uh, but the reason we're able to do that is because of the secondary growth. So that secondary growth is going to be adding on those layers of girth. And so that's what we see is those rings that develop as it builds each year's growth on. So the reason it was able to be done that way was because there was new, uh, these new layers are formed from what we call the cambium. The cambium is on the inside of the tree. If we could peel back each layer of the tree, this is what it would look like on the inside. Each has its own function to provide life to the tree. This very thin cambium layer here is where the cells are produced that create the new layers of tissue as either xylem or phloem, which will expand the girth of the tree. The process of creating these layers each year will come into play a little bit later on when we talk about branch attachment. The rate of growth of the xylem tissue does not stay consistent throughout the growing season. The pale layers were produced in the spring when water was abundantly available and the tree could easily grow. As that wet spring turned into a drier summer, the growth started to slow and the tissue density increased, causing the dark layers that aid in our counting of trees age. So as you can see in here, the rings that appear darker and narrower than others those ones can indicate a little bit more of a year that the tree might have experienced some drought conditions. So if there was less available water for the tree, those rings will have had less uh, growth and less spreading, so they'll be much more dense and much darker. These are useful for people who want to see what weather conditions were like over the last 100 plus years. You have this, well, it, hardwood is actually not living wood, but you have this document that was living through it and really saved those pieces of stages where the world was, where the environment was, what was going on. And you can see that as you get further into the tree, but a tree that's mature, you can have uh, completely hiding it on the inside. We're gonna talk a few minutes about how that's possible. Um, but just so you see, those early woods, that's gonna be the spring, and the late woods gonna be produced in the summer. So all dependent on when those rings are being produced. So the reason that that was able to hide it within is because trees, they don't heal after we make a wound to them, they seal. So trees have a natural defense system to respond to wounds, which we call compartmentalization of decay in trees, or CODIT. The discovery of CODIT came from the studying of thousands of longitudinal cross sections of trees by Dr. Alex Shigo through the US Forest Service. With his research, we are able to understand this defense system and adjust our care practices to reflect this and to respect the trees. We know from the intro to pruning that when a branch is removed, it's going to form that callus tissue that closes up an exposed area. You see in the photo on the left here, that large wound seems to be taking its time sealing and is going to be home to something quite undesirable in there. Right in there. So we've got this little, little fungal growth happening inside there. What we would rather have seen is if this branch had not been, um, it might not have been actively removed, it might have been removed by a weather event or something else. The 
But regardless, we don't want to have this large of wounds on our trees, especially at that mature age. As a tree gets older, it's going to be a little bit tougher for it to respond to those wounds. Very similar to humans, as we start to age, it gets more difficult for us to recover and respond when we get sick. And trees are just the same. As you have these larger wounds that form on mature trees, it's going to be a lot more difficult to uh, respond and for the tree to focus on uh, producing that seal uh, through the system we're about to talk about. Whereas if it had been a young tree and a much smaller branch, it would have been a lot easier for that to respond appropriately. Okay, so going a little bit further into what uh, CODA is, CODA is going to be the process of creating four barriers or walls that the tree uses and forms to slowly isolate and de uh, to slow and isolate decay. The walls are numbered in increasing order of their ability to slow the movement of decay. So wall three is going to be stronger than wall two, wall four is going to be stronger than wall three, and wall one is going to be the weakest. In the image here, we can see where the wound is visible from the bark, but the area of decay spreads much further into the tree. So we wouldn't be able to see this typically with our naked eye on a living specimen, but this uh, cross-sectional drawing is able to represent it. Um, and there are a lot of really great images out there of actual cross-sections of wood we'll get to in a couple of slides to see what that looks like as it's going on. Once the tree has stimulated defense response for that wound, the first wall will be to shut down the xylem tissue both above and below the wound. Remember a few slides back, the xylem is the living tissue inside the tree that's gonna be transporting water. So then deposits of chemicals that are produced naturally in other areas of the tree, they're gonna plug up the xylem and form this barrier. It's a really starchy, uh, I believe, starch-based material and so, that's really able to kind of stop and plug those uh, they're like straws really to really stop them and keep that transportation going and passing through where the infected area is. So the tree is really just trying to prevent the transport in the xylem that's adjacent to the wound and really stop the slow and spread of decay. Give the tree a couple more times, a little bit more time to develop those next barriers and really get to that last one, which is where we're looking for uh, being that final step in the process. The second wall isn't formed. Where we think that the first wall is formed through the plugging of that xylem tissue, the second wall isn't necessarily formed as a reaction to the wound, but it's an existing barrier that already is present within the tree and it's the growth rings. So when we talked about that early wood and late wood, the process of developing those and having those different layers of density creates a difficult path for decay to pass through. And so when you do have that year where there was a lot less rain, a lot less water availability for the tree, and it was able to produce a much thicker uh, late wood ring, that dense wood is gonna be a lot stronger at holding up and preventing the decay from spreading than your early wood or a less um, or more a less dense late wood as well. So uh, it'll keep breaking through each of those barriers until it hits one that's too strong and it can't get any further. So that's why we have those each signaled out because the tree can start to break through sometimes each of those second walls, but hopefully eventually it'll hit one that is strong and the decay cannot spread any further. The third wall, it also comes from that existing cells, but this is going to be a little bit different. Ray cells are cells that extend radially from the center of the tree in a spoke-like manner, but they don't extend the full uh, radius or the full height of the tree. They're just little transport uh, cells that get stuff going back and forth between uh, the different layers of the tree. And so what the tree does is it is, um, oh, so what it is, is that, um, those ray cells, they are also really rich in chemicals that are going to prevent the decay from spreading. So as you can see here, those rays, the way they go laterally, think about the way we would chop, uh, like if this was wood, you were making firewood, you're gonna be chopping with that like a piece of pie. You don't chop it uh, with directionally with where you would see those growth rings, you wanna chop it in the center. And so what you're doing is slicing those rays. And so the rays being that kind of lateral wall, when those have the chemical response to uh, prevent the decay from spreading. The decay is 
just not going to get past it. There's a lot of starchiness in them and it's going to snap before going too far into it. So those third walls are going to be on the outside. And our fourth wall is really the one that we've been waiting for. And the first three walls are just trying to prevent the decay from spreading while we finish up that fourth wall. The fourth wall is going to be when that new layer of tissue is produced by the cambium and it finally seals off and contains the decay inside of years and years of continued growth. So this wall is what we see on the outside and that's what we look for when we want to have good clean wounds that produce that proper seal and really uh, help keep the tree safe for the future and prevent more uh, exposure. Here we have two different situations of trees that uh, responded to have wounds that responded with uh, coated. So on the left here, we cannot see wall one because we would be looking straight down upon it uh, the way this is a cross section. So we can't see the first, uh, the first wall. The growth rings, as you can see, those ones are going to be that second wall. You can see a little bit uh, along where those red arrows are that it was stopped at some points earlier on in certain walls um, in certain years. And then it did spread a little bit further in other years. So depending on where the thickness was, where the density was of those rings, that's where it's gonna be holed up. Um, on either side of that darkened area, you can see to the point where those rays are and where it just really, really stopped. So that number three, it has a final point there and that's where the rays had enough of that starch in them to prevent the decay from spreading even further. And then wall four, you can see really, really nicely where that clean uh, new, new wood is being formed on the outside, although this tree did not have the potential to fully seal up that wound. Um, it was taken down a little too, too early for that, but we get to learn from it. And so uh, eventually that would have fully closed up and completely contained the decay to the point where in a few more years, you might never know that there was the wound and the tree will continue on. So. As you see in the image on the right, it was able to do that. So this one, it did not seal, or it sealed, it did not heal. So as we can see, there's still that piece of the remaining uh, stem tissue that was removed at the time. You can see that completely contained in it. So if we were to be healing something, we would think about it completely being taken away and about having your body break it down. So that's how we as humans would respond. Tree does not respond the same way just gonna completely seal it up and just isolate it and contain it within the wood and keep growing on and uh, have a healthy future if it had had the chance to do so. So this is what we wanna see. This is the outside that we were talking about. The one on the full on the left is uh, almost completely encased and probably within a couple of years, it'll be absolutely perfect. Uh, the one on the right is just a year or two out um, getting that callus tissue forming. And you can see in both of them, if you think back to when we were talking about our introduction to pruning, we wanted to really look for the branch bark ridge and the branch collar. And as we can see in both of these images, the branch bark ridge is still present. It has that nice little frown. So we can see that it was uh, properly removed and these were some really nice cuts. So uh, now that we've gone over a little bit of some deep uh, biology basics, uh, let's get back to going how, uh, Going down to those goals of pruning, getting back to our foundation um, and talk about really how do you, how do these things apply and how do they make your choices when you approach tree pruning a little bit different. So we have all of our goals again, we read through them before. Remember only 25% of live canopy. And so when we look at this, we wanna make sure that we're going to start with those dead and damaged branches. We learned an introduction to pruning that we can take those off. They don't count towards our pruning allowance. So they're not part of that 25%, 25% of live tree canopy. Uh, and so we do want to properly remove those branches so that we don't damage the tissue that is needed to seal the wound. So as you can see in the images on the left, we covered those in intro to pruning, making sure you can identify where cuts need to be made on both hardwoods and conifers and then learning and practicing the three cut method to prevent damaging that branch collar. So go back to those uh, videos if you need to re review them at all. But moving forward, I wanna know, uh, we're gonna take a minute here to launch a poll. I wanna know, have you guys ever seen a tree with something painted on the wound like this? So this black uh, tar paint, I'm gonna give you about a minute to look at the poll question and see yes or no, have you seen something like this before? And do you know what might be, uh, what the practice might be? So as we were talking about, um, 
we're thinking about removing the branches and having the tree be able to respond and seal. And in any part of that, we talk about the limitations of the tree to be able to help itself out. Do we need to be supporting it? Do we need to be aiding it? Okay, looks like we're getting our uh, poll questions in there. And yep, you guys, most of you are, you have seen something like this, but we really don't want to be seeing that in our, uh, on our trees. This practice of painting tar onto tree wounds is completely unnecessary and even inhibits the tree's natural response, which is to seal that wound. And so by applying that, you're creating a chemical barrier that uh, really inhibits the tree's ability to react appropriately and it's just really not necessary. So surprisingly, the image on the bottom there, I actually took a couple blocks away from my uh, apartment in Portland. So it does still go on. You still see it around here and uh, it's important to really just educate people on uh, what practices are needed and how we really need to keep take care of our trees. So uh, don't, don't go painting anything on those tree wounds. We do not need it. So talking about uh, removing these branches, there's two ways that branches will come off of a tree. Mechanically, so a human, a force of nature like wind or snow, or some other pressure from the physical world that caused the branch to separate from the parent stem. The other way is through a biological process called clapsis, more commonly known as shedding. We all know that many trees lose their leaves in the fall or needles every few years, that even dropping leaves prematurely due to drought or other stresses are a way for trees to protect themselves. So we see a lot of our Western red cedar lately turning brown and shedding some needles, uh, shedding those needles during the summer months. Trees, they can respond to branches in much of the same way. And it's usually due to stress as well. So whether it's from drought, disease, or maybe it's a shaded branch that the tree really deems to be not as much use as it is a uh, hindrance or a use of energy on the tree, uh, it can kind of have a response, a chemical response that will naturally shed that branch. So when we think about the process of forming that seal after we remove a branch, the tree is able to do a similar process before the branch is removed by creating a chemical layer, a specialized layer of tissue that's gonna to form to separate the branch from the parent stem. Uh, certain tree species are much more favorable, favorable to this habit um, of self-care. So some of that uh, we have around here that are pretty common are honey locust and crepe myrtle. You'll notice that a lot of their lower branches are very often uh, dead looking, but it's really just because the tree, it cuts off the uh, focus on those branches and really focus it back onto those that are much more productive and beneficial to the tree overall. Um, this process, it's perfectly natural and it doesn't really need our assistance. So if you see the dead branch, um, it's okay to remove that. It might be uh, partway through that process there, you might not know. But regardless, you can still remove that and the uh, tree will continue its process and really seal that uh, spot off and continue to be healthy for the future. Um, so that's really it's a biological response. It's not too explored yet. It's a really interesting um, topic to look at some interesting research papers on in the field of arboriculture. So if you are interested in some of that, just reach out to me. I'd love to chat about that because I get very excited about new, new topics and things. Um, and I'd be happy to share that with you guys. Since we are the responsible party for the, the mechanical removals for the most part, that's rarely where we're going to be focusing on for the rest of today. Uh, it's valuable to know how the tree will respond to the wound and that it can be um, doing its own thing at the same time, but really we're just going to focus on the mechanical side of stuff. Back in intro to pruning, we did talk about this. We covered the difference between a removal cut and a reduction cut. Now that we know a little bit more about the biology of the tree, we have a little bit different understanding as to why you really do want to have the removal cut be a favorable option over the reduction cut. The difference between those is really that size of which stem is coming back. But as you can see, the removal cut is bringing it back to where you have that branch collar, you have that branch bark ridge, and it's going to be able to respond in an appropriate way. Whereas a reduction cut, it doesn't have that specialized tissue. It doesn't have all those things going on in that same area. It's going, it's going to be a little bit more difficult for the tree to respond and to really form a nice, uh, excuse me, a nice callus tissue for that uh, wound to seal up. Um, so 
given that all we talked about, let's uh, see some great videos that I've got from uh, a former coworker, now working out of New York City. Uh, follow her on Instagram, The Study of Trees. She had these videos. Um, they are not of trees, they are vines, but it's a woody stem that was cut in uh, early spring, back when the water was really flowing, just to demonstrate how significant it is to see that water and all the nutrients and everything that's in that tree, the transport, just coming right out of the tree as you remove it and as you do that. So it is really causing a big injury today. So let's just check that out to see what it's like. You can see that just dripping right straight out of it, pouring from it. Um, and this isn't just, uh, hap it happens in Portland as well, not just areas that get a lot of that snow melt. It happens around here as well. Uh, there's a couple trees down my block I saw the other day that somebody had not done the best, best pruning job. I gotta probably go back and clean that up for them. But they had uh, some wounds and it had a very similar appearance to this on the left here where you have that kind of um, crystallized uh, sugar there because this isn't just water. This is, uh, this is the blood of the tree. So you can see those xylem, those tubes opening up as they're being drained. It's pretty cool to see just watching the life force of the tree coming out of it through all those different uh, tubes going through the branch there. And so think about that when you do make a um, make your reduction cut. So you know, this is what you're exposing. This is what's going to be open. And I would not want to have a wound exposed like that for myself. Okay, so let's do another uh, quiz. Which one do we want to do? Do we want to remove uh, this little stub here at cut A? Do we want to remove it at cut B? Or do we want to just leave it the way it is because the tree has already been responding to it, it looks pretty old, and we don't need to do anything. I would go with cut A as well. We don't want to go and do cut B because that would absolutely get cut into the callus tissue where it's already starting to seal. That would really just put a hindrance on the tree's ability. Um, you could leave it the way it is, but that little stub, it does uh, prevent that little last bit of seal from forming and you're just going to have to wait for it to eventually hopefully rot off and fall away anyway. So let's just go with cut A, make it a nice clean finish and allow the tree to seal that wound up nicely. Okay, let's do another one. Okay, do we want to remove or reduce? Do we want to make cut A, which is a removal cut, cut B, a removal cut? or cut C, a reduction cut. Okay, we've got a couple of people who said cut A. Uh, most of you said cut B and nobody went for cut C. So I appreciate that. I would not go with cut C. That's gonna be that reduction that's going to expose and not be the best for our tree. Um, cut A, it does start to get into that branch bark ridge up there. You can see it a little bit in uh, the spot here, but it's not quite as easily found. So. So I wanna look at different tree species. So this here we have um, paper bark maple. Um, and so that has a really flaky paper like bark. And so we're not easily able to see some of the attributes of growth on that tree. So branch bark ridge is kind of hidden, but you can still see it in there a little bit, change in coloration. And so I'd really rather, I feel more comfortable making cut B. It's a smaller wound and it's not getting into any of the tissue, any of the damage. And I think it's probably the best option for us. So great job, guys. Our next one is going to be removing root suckers and adventitious growth from the trunk. So spring is a really beautiful time to see all the nice blooming and things coming around there, but it's also a great time to see all the adventitious growth and the root suckers coming up on the, the sides of trees and really starting to create some visibility issues for vehicles and pedestrians. Uh, but it degrades the otherwise positive spring bloom vibe. So after recently uh, describing what this type of growth was, that adventitious growth to a non-tree friend, uh, they came up with a really good comparison that I like to think of um, nowadays is that these, uh, this adventitious, ro uh, adventitious growth root suckers, they're kind of like the hangnails of trees. You really just want to want to pick at them and get rid of them. They'll still come back, um, but maybe you have to like live with them or figure out how to adapt to them. So Similar to that, we're gonna look at what is causing that. So this growth is actually coming from what we call epicormic sprouts or suckers or adventitious growth, water sprouts, lots of different names. Whatever it is, it's not the same type of growth as it would be if it was a true branch. So 
they're actually coming from dormant cells that are embedded into the bark of the tree from an early age. And that little cell, they have a little tiny lifeline going back to that, uh, back into the tree to still maintain some of those energy stores if needed, but it's a very fine connection and it's not the same level of structural integrity that you would find with a better or more established branch attachment. Uh, and so these, they remain dormant on the, in the bark of the tree until something triggers them to come back to life. So some kind of stressor has to impact them. Maybe it's excessive pruning. Maybe there's some root damage or death, uh, really cold temperatures, excessive cold or change in a water availability, a lot of different things, but they wake them up. And because this is a reaction to stress, it's important for us to figure out what that stressor is and work to mitigate that problem. So keep within your pruning allowance, look into other ways to promote good soil compaction, provide water to young trees or trees struggling through the dry summer months, looking at what else is going on. Tree pruning and tree care is always going to be a holistic opportunity to really look at the tree, look at what's going on, see are there other things affecting what's happening here. Uh, you can still clear away those little suckers down there, get rid of them, um, maintaining clearance, all that, but Thinking about what is causing them to come out of hiding for the day is really what you're looking for right now. Uh, not just thinking about removal, even though that's easy. So this tree here, we've got a tulip tree and it's in the right of way. It has a very small tree lawn for a very large tree. And it also has some jungle equipment hanging from it. So there's a few things going on. There might be other things going on up in the canopy. There could be some other things uh, we don't know about. There looks like a little bit of some weird discoloration at the base of the, the root collar there. Um, so a lot of different factors going on here, but causing that, that stress growth and just producing branches in places that are not desirable for the tree or for us having trees in an urban environment. Okay, so selecting a single leader, remove or reduce codominant branches. The guidance of selecting a single leader as you train a young tree is really important to promote healthy structure, but it's not necessarily applicable to all trees. So after our intro to pruning last month, I had a couple questions that people, they saw it, they're like, okay, I've got this list. I went out and I said, this does not look like my tree. I don't know what to do. I'm confused, I'm lost. I feel uh, dejected now and not inspired to do it because I just don't know how to get past number three. And so knowing this, we have to know that different species have different growth patterns and different branching patterns. Knowing this and knowing how to adjust your approach will ease the process of determining what your prescription for is going to be. So let's look at a couple pictures here. So the younger the tree is at the time of removal of a co-dominant stem, the more resilient the tree will be and the more likely, more likely to recover from that wound. So the one on the left, we can see it has some co-dominant competing um, stems there. And then the one in the middle, it has three going on there. So you have a triad and then we have two on the right. So there's a couple different options here of splitting, but there's a number of reasons that competing stems with branch attachments are really undesirable. And that can include, uh, that can include included bark, uh, poor internal structure, creates a, an environment for standing water and rot, uh, opportunities for that. So there's a couple, quite a few reasons, but Another reason is because as the two stems are competing, the tree is dividing its energy between the two rather than the one stem or the three, as we see in the middle picture. As the Portland Parks and Recreation Director, Adina Long says, do less better. And we want our trees to follow that as well. Follow a single main stem and put all the energy into that rather than focusing the energy into multiple stems and not having the most efficient growth possible. So, really do less better, focus on that one good stem and really uh, getting a good strong specimen for your tree. So let's do a quiz now. We're going to see, would you guys rather take off the left or the right competing stem here? And I'll give you a little bit of time to see that and talk about that through with uh, whoever your pruning buddy might be joining you today and go through that process. So we have two different options here. We can either remove the left or we can remove the right. You can see a few different things going on here. It's quite young still. So we wanna make sure that we're doing that while it is still able to uh, seal and heal, seal and recover from that wound. And then also to be able to um, grow up and get into a good healthy form and good 
strong leader and good structure. So getting that early on is really important. So we want to uh, nip that in the bud. If you guys can see here, based on the thorns, this tree is a hawthorn. And it looks like our answers are coming in pretty quickly. Okay, let's see, this poll is quick. And everybody did agree. So we're gonna take the right one out. There's a couple of people who said we might take the left one. Uh, the left one we could, uh, there's no reason that it's absolutely egregious. The tree will eventually figure out a good uh, form. It'll be straight and fine. But I think I'd like to take the right one off. There's some other stuff going on behind it with other attachments. And I just feel like the left one is going to uh, be good for the future and grow into a great tree. So that was good, good working through that together. Now get a little bit more uh, complicated beyond just the co-dominant stems. We're gonna start with two different growth structures. So the easy one's X-current form trees. These are gonna be most of our conifers, although there are a few of the smaller form ones are less so. Uh, many of our deciduous trees, such as sweet gum, sycamore, pin oak, tulip tree, little leaf linden, and a few others are, they're ex-current while they are young and you're able to get that good leader trained. But as they start to get into the mature form, so after about you know 20 years or so, they get more into the decurrent form. So they get more of the broad spreading form that we'll see in the next slide. But while they're young, you really are able to help uh, maintain them to get that kind of thin, tall uh, leader in the middle there. And if you notice there's a similarity between a lot of these trees is that they're gonna be ones that you want to be tall and mature at um, tall and with the lowest temporary branches or lowest permanent branches being pretty high up. So these are gonna be big growers. You wanna make sure that they have good structure early on to be a good tree for the future. Um, <clears throat> Ex-current trees, they're pretty easy to maintain that central leader and they typically have really well spaced and attached scaffolding branches. So a lot of our conifers don't need any additional pruning. Um, they're really great at going upright and maintaining good structure and really having great uh, branch angles. So we see that we have these some good branch angles on these three trees here, and we're gonna talk a little bit more about that in a few minutes. Um, but moving on to going from X current to the other one is D current. So at this point in the presentation, I wanna stop and I wanna think where, where are we right now? Where are the trees that we're working with right now? We are all in an urban environment. And that really has a huge impact on how, how we live, how our trees live, how things interact with each other. And so trees growing in a forest, they really have to compete for those resources like sunlight. And as a result, they have their co-dominant stems split much higher up if they do. And so by having that, they're gonna be a lot more, um, a lot, lot taller canopy than we expect to see around here in an urban environment. So as decurrent trees, they start to mature in these urban environments, their cone dominant stems are separating a lot lower on the trees. And while your young tree is young, you want to encourage it to, over a few years, maybe maintain a strong central stem and remove any of those competing leaders to allow your tree to get a little bit longer uh, time developing its strong parent trunk, good trunk taper, um, really to be a strong specimen that can support a mature canopy. Uh, a lot of common decurrent trees that you'll find around Portland are going to be your elm, your big leaf maple, cherry, ash, and our Oregon white oak. So they're pretty common around here. Oh, you can see a little D, D shape going on there. Uh, but some of them are nice little bubbles like the one on the left. And some of them, like the ginkgos on the right, have a little bit more of a bristly form. So not always very um, predictable, but maybe take a walk after and go around your neighborhood and look at the mature canopies of trees and the young canopies of trees and say, do you think that's a decurrent form? Is that an X current form? Talk it through with somebody or take a picture and send it to another friend and be like, do you think that this is this type of form or where is the central leader? Why are these branches so low? Why are these branches so high? And comparing different species. So uh, I really always recommend taking some walks and just checking out trees and how their growth forms are a little bit different as you go. Uh, so removing lowest temporary branches to raise the canopy for clearance and visibility. It's one of the most common reasons that our volunteers are out there pruning street trees. And you really have to think about the priorities when you're pruning for clearance. Because it is a balance between the tree health and present and its future hazards and safety before it's too late. So you only have that 25% of living tree canopy. That can be a lot taken up real quickly. So 
thinking about maintaining those uh, city standards for seven and a half feet over sidewalk and 11 and a half over residential street, 14 feet over uh, arterial streets. You wanna maintain those standards, but really thinking about even if it's in the printing budget, it may leave the tree in a weak state. So hitting those uh, standards are gonna be sometimes taken a little bit over a couple years. So you might not need to approach it and do everything all at once, Branches that are low on the young tree's trunk, they do help to develop that good taper, make it a strong tree. So you'll wanna leave those branches, those lower ones in place for at least two years after planting. Um, so maybe about three to four years after you do plant the tree, can be when you start to slowly address them by removing them over a period of two to three years as well. So not everything doing at once, just coming back and having a set pattern for yourself and setting some goals and standards to follow through on the care and to make sure that you do return and you do finish up on uh, the goals of tree pruning and taking care of your trees. So let's talk through this next one here. Do you think that this, we have a dogwood here, it was a street, it is a street tree and it looks like the people have been removing the branches down here around this area, they were kind of whirling you can see two of the wounds do look a little bit older than um, another one. So there's some different ages. And as we talked about, you can see that uh, epicormic growth, that adventitious growth coming out from uh, where we did impact the tree with some stress. We removed three different branches. So the tree's like, hey, that was a lot of camp you took from me. I need to be able to still produce energy to survive. And so we'll put out these little leaves down here to help along. But we can just prune those right off if we would like. But do you guys think that we want to be removing this branch? Uh, do we want to do it now? Do we want to do it in the future? Should we do it before it becomes a hazard, after it becomes a hazard? When do we want to think about addressing this, it, this branch here? And do we even want to address this branch? Does it need to be? You can see that we're starting to get a little bit of included bark in the middle there, but it is a large uh, stem now coming off of that parent stem. What I would personally do, I think the, uh, Something you do respond that you think that we should remove it now because there is a potential for hazard. But I want to remind you, this is a dogwood. And how big is a dogwood going to get at maturity? It's going to get maybe 20, 25 feet. This tree will never be that big where that branch will become the size that is going to be a really big safety hazard for people or pedestrians or vehicles. We're not going to end up having to worry about this too much in the future. So unless it becomes decayed and shows signs of decline, I'm gonna leave that branch on there. It doesn't need to be taken off, and honestly, it's probably a lot of the canopy that's remaining right now, so we do wanna leave that on for the tree to really finish uh, recovering and sealing up those wounds that are on it already, and there's no reason to take the additional uh, branch from it right now. And so let's look at these guys here. They're little, they're young, but they're established. So when do we decide that the tree is able to handle the impact of clearance pruning? It's all gonna come back to that 25% and what our goals are and what our allowance is and what else we have to take care of at the same time. So are there other, issue, other, other issues to address first? And what does the surrounding area look like? So this, these trees here, they have a gorgeous tree lawn that they can grow in. Um, although it still inhibits a little bit of the vehicle and pedestrian visibility, uh, there is a lot of clearance between those, those trees uh, due to their spacing, so I feel pretty okay about that. Um, but if you have a tree like this and you're trying to decide on the timing of pruning for clearance, look around and see what else is going on in the street. Weigh the priority of raising your canopy versus addressing the other issues that you may want to get to sooner. So it is a balancing process, uh, maybe a little bit at a time, and Maybe next year you can come back and do a little bit more. So not going overboard and really focusing on uh, less is better. So never forget that. <clears throat> we wanna remove bad attachments and rubbing branches. So bad attachments and rubbing branches, just as these, uh, just as the tree will envelope wounds with new growth, branches that start to rub will fuse over time, but they don't have the strength that a properly formed branch will have. You see here in this image on the left, there was a branch that was rubbing up against another. And so really we might not wanna actually be removing it at this point. It's a nice picture to be able to see. And it was really interesting because now we can see how each of those new growth rings, each new layer had to form 
with and around that branch that was uh, pushing itself into the growth. And so I wouldn't have removed this branch at the time, but you probably would have wanted to address this at a much earlier age uh, before it gets to be that time. So now rather than having the, the one spot of included bark, you have an exposed wound here and you have another exposed wound here. It looks dark and brown, but it's still um, a lot of tissue and accessible transport tissue within the tree that is exposed to potential pests and pathogens. Um, so we, wanna do, we don't wanna have uh, rubbing branches. It causes a lot of damage. So really removing those before they become problematic is what we're looking for. Over on the right here, we can see there's a really large piece of, um, a large area of included bark. So those branches, they have this divide of not continuous growth tissue. And so that's gonna to start to uh, continue to grow and expand. And really what's gonna end up happening is something like we see in these images. So the uh, branch eventually will fail. It was not able to support. And you can see on this one in the right image here, there's a little crevice. And so you can kind of think maybe there was some rubbing branches that became included years and years ago, similar to this uh, image we saw on the last slide. And as a mature species, it finally, or mature specimen, it finally had the opportunity to fail many, many years later. So we identified that the competing stems are considered bad or poor attachments, but what are we looking for in a good attachment? All we really want from a good branch attachment is that it can support and maintain the branch that stays on the trunk. So it's not a very complicated job, it's just not always the easy job. And so that's where we really need the tree to form a strong branch union, and where we need to encourage their development as well. These images on the left here, they have some really nice spacing, they have a really good angle. We like to tell folks to look for uh, that 45 degree angle, so we can see that here. Uh, so that birch right on the left there is a very, very nice um, spacing on it. And so we're looking for that so that it can continue to form these layers uh, of strength to bond and fuse those branches to the parent stem. Sometimes you do have stems that are split right on the image on the right here. What we really like to think about as a, a rule of thumb is if it's forming a V, it's bad because that's going to be where you'll have the included bark. This is more of a U shape, so it has a little bit of a more rounded area. You don't have as much of that included bark and it's going to be a much stronger union than you would have with the V. Neither of them are terribly desirable, but I would rather have this uh, form right here than what we had seen in the previous slides. And just to see what it looks like on a conifer here, we have um, the conifer on the left. We can see that branch collar and the branch bark ridge, and it has formed a very nice um, attachment with those pieces, and those are just indicators that the tree has formed that branch. So a lot of times you'll find um, some are not very visible, but uh, just practicing looking at different trees and trying to identify the different parts so you know where to make your cuts, where things are attached. This uh, maple on the right here has some very nice 45 degree attachments um, and they are opposite as is uh, indicative of a maple. And how is it forming those good uh, attachments? So we said that it's forming those nice layers, the branch bark ridge and the branch collar, what's causing those to form? We're going to do the process of layering. So we were talking about earlier the development of those uh, layers of early wood and late wood. Those are being developed both in the parent stem tissue, the main trunk, and also in the individual branches. So as each of those are developing their layers, they alternate and overlap each other, very similar to um, like laminate board. And so it's uh, going to have those layers that are making that strong bond together. So they're holding one another and creating that uh, tight, tight joint there. So why do we need to have these? Because the branches need to be able to support gravitational and directional forces. So when wind, leaves, snow, or other man-made structures cause these branches to experience a gravitational or directional force, the branch attachment as well as the branch itself are experiencing stress and strain. The stress and strain is going to be called a live load, and it's important that a structure be able to fully support the live load in order for it to be safe. So when a structure or a branch is too weak to support the load, it can break due to the stress and strain of the force that exerts on parts of the structure. So 
It's what causes a bridge to a bridge or a building to collapse under strain sometimes, and it causes what the branch to fail under certain conditions. So heavy snows on tree branches that still have leaves on them are very problematic because it's supporting a lot more weight than that branch is accustomed to and can oftentimes lead to a failure. So it all comes back to that growing and how that layering is going to support the tree and how that process uh, really forms a good strong bond between holding and supporting all the weight that the branch uh, has on it between the branches, the stems off the branches, the leaves, uh, all the fruit, any kind of wildlife, all sorts of stuff going on and just the weight of having winds and other forces against it um, has a really, really hard job to do. So making sure that that tree has the ability to form that good angle, that good bond, and really as you see that branch collar is where you have that double layering and it's really starting to get a little bit thicker. So you wanna look for that um, on those good strong, strong bond attachments there. And so our final one here is that we want to identify permanent branches and remove temporary ones. Do you remember one of the first slides? It was about how does a tree grow? We said that we do, uh, we said that trees, they do the roots and the shoots first, and then they work on adding the girth. But as your tree continues to establish during the next five to 10 years, you wanna to start to decide which branches are not going to remain in the mature canopy of the tree and which will. It's gonna be entirely dependent on your tree species and what its mature height will be, planting location and a plant growth rate, all sorts of things. So when we saw that dogwood earlier, we know that that's not going to get terribly tall, so it's okay to have branches that are lower. If we planted a ginkgo or a tulip tree or an Oregon white oak, in a few years, we're gonna to wanna to start to lift and remove some of those lower branches in the lower um, 10 feet or so, just to start to force the canopy up a little bit more and get them out of the way and have the tree not reliant on those lower branches um, to inspire them to be a little bit more of a good strong form structure that you might see in a forest tree. Okay. So um, it can be pretty quick that you can take off a lot of the lower branches here. So let's look at this image, um, these two images here. So we have a ginkgo on the left, which I did just say, it's one of those ones that we do wanna focus on. So uh, we're probably a little bit, a couple years beyond where I'd like to be for removing some of the lower permanent branches or the lower temporary branches. But uh, I would start to definitely take some of that off, maybe not removing entire branches at a time, but maybe reducing them before going for like a full removal of that branch, just because you do want to make sure that there's enough remaining living canopy for the tree to recover and be able to take on more um, pruning the subsequent years. Um, and so I just, you really see this tree here, you wanted to approach it, there's some stuff that's kind of going over to the left and other branches that may be off there. There could be other things that need to be uh, managed and handled. I can bet we're probably not doing anything with the leader on this tree unless you somehow have really good, um, really good arm reach. But remember what we said, we want to make our, sure our feet are on the ground and we're only doing things that are safe for us. So this tree is not going to get too much care from us. We hope to maybe do some thinning um, removal of a little bit of the stuff down at the very bottom before eventually raising that canopy over the next few years. The image on the right, we have a tricolor beach. And we can see it's going quite a bit funky. And you might look at that and say, where do I even start? There's competing leaders. There's something going on down at the bottom there. There's a lot of different stuff happening in this picture. There's whatever that branch is doing up over on the left, uh, trying to jump over the sidewalk here. And so when we look at this tree, there's a couple different things that I want to think about. I know coming into this that this is not an uncommon form to see coming out of a lot of nursery stock. We see this a lot with uh, beaches, just beaches specifically, where they will have that separation of a lot of growth down at the base, uh, and then a lot of canopy growth up the top. Uh, and it'll be this way for a couple years. You can do a little bit of uh, pruning back of the stuff at the bottom, but I would really leave it because that bottom half is 50% of your canopy right now. It is a huge amount of growth. So it looks unsightly. It looks like um, some pretty, uh, not great branching and the tree looks pretty weird right now, but I would really focus on just letting the tree continue to grow, uh, it's established and really focusing on putting on that girth and getting a little bit more height involved too. And focusing on that central leader would be where I would start with this tree. And then in a few years, probably at least five years from now, maybe think about looking at that bottom there.
looking at them before they get to be too thick and it'll be too much of a removal, but still balancing how much canopy is living on that tree to really recover and bounce back from that. So let's go over just what we did today. So trees are pretty cool, but urban trees really do need our care. And what my goal for presenting this material today was for you to understand a bit better how trees grow and function, that they are these complex and living organisms. And when they are our neighbors in urban areas and we need to support them, just as we would any other neighbor, if not a bit more. So primary growth is going to be your roots and shoots. Secondary is adding on the girth. The girth is layered by new layers of pre-bark and sapwood. And as the layers of sapwood created the parent stem and the branch overlap, they created that strong branch union. So that early wood, that late wood, it's going to be overlapping. This is important to look for when you're pruning your tree, identifying those strong attachments, select them for those for permanent branches. And if you're still a little bit unsure, do some research on the tree you're going to be pruning. So what's the, what's the species you have? And the internet has some great resources and recommendations on pruning for specific species, especially with identifying if you should anticipate an X current or D current tree. Try to avoid reduction cuts unless necessary and removal cuts properly conducted are best for achieving swift compartmentalization of the wound. Before you head out after this to do any pruning, please visit our website at portlandoregon.gov trees to check if you need a permit to get started. Volunteer with community groups such as local tree team or Friends of Trees for some on-hand experience and practice throughout the year. Prune with a neighbor. Do the trees on your street look to be in need of a little love? Reach out to a neighbor and prune together while still maintaining physical distance. Trees pruning, tree pruning is a great social activity and everyone benefits when you talk through your approach and pruning, pruning budget. Like I said earlier, it's really great to have a nice holistic experience and talk through the process and know what you're gonna do because you can always take more of a branch off. You cannot put a branch back on. Maybe take your friends on a walk or a furry friend too and take a bit of extra time and look at the trees you pass and see if there are good or ba bad branch attachments. Are there competing leaders? Is there clearance issue that maybe you want to have a chat with your neighbor about? Seeing and looking at more trees and how they each grow will help build your understanding for how to care for different trees. And I want to thank you guys for all joining us today. Uh, any additional questions, you can reach us at ufvolunteers at portlandoregon.gov. And to learn more about our programming's upcoming and in the past, please go to portlandoregon.gov slash trees slash get involved. Thanks.